I work for a ministry called Living Leadership, as you can see here on the screen in the UK. Getting to be much wider a field as well. We disciple Christian leaders, we pastor pastors. You can find us at www.livingleadership.org. You can find me on Twitter if you are interested after this. I am not a clinician and I am not a counselor, but I spend my life discipling church leaders. Uh, I used to do that for UCCF, IFES a little bit, uh, but for the last 17 years, uh, mainly church leaders. We're going to do this in two sections. Firstly, we will think about how we get into burnout as church and organization leaders, because it's helpful to think about what gets us down the slippery slope, and then hopefully for us to identify things in advance that might help us avoid it, because it's much better to have a fence at the top of the cliff than an ambulance later on in the valley, isn't it? And then we'll have some Q&A, and then in the second part, we will think about how we can get on the road to recovery, how we can help other people on the road to recovery, how we can establish leadership cultures that are sufficiently healthy that we are usually buoyed up and, uh, and not getting towards burnout. And then we'll have some Q&A after that too, if there's time. I am well aware that this will be a subject that is very close to home for some of us. And if the issues are affecting you personally at the moment, please make every effort after this to make sure that you get some good support if you don't already have it. We are not meant to be treading into this perilous country of leadership on our own. You know how quest stories start? They always start with some delightful pastoral scene and it's all fine. And then you cross over the edge of the wild and it all gets very nasty. <laughs> if you're in the, 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 the first act at the moment, make sure you get the support now for the second act. And if you're in the second act and you're on your own, then you need to get the support as well. If you don't have access to any of it, it might be that Living Leadership can help you. Take a little note here of our uh, website address, www.livingleadership.org. We have what we call our Associates Network, which is a network uh, growing, uh, certainly around the UK and Ireland, but now into Europe, of pastors of pastors, and it may be that we can get somebody who will walk alongside you and obviously pick up on a lot of the year-round mentoring stuff that the forum provides as well. Burnout is remarkably common in Christian leadership situations. Remarkably common. The average age in the UK at which people leave Christian leadership in epidemic numbers is around 45 or 15 years in, whichever comes first. There is an attrition spike that goes through the roof for a whole host of reasons that we will talk about. Too often we can feel like Matt Damon in The Martian. Help is only 140 million miles away. The key difference, of course, for Christian leaders is the Apostle Paul says that your job and my job is to be workers with other people for their progress in the faith and their joy in God so that everybody else is glorying abundantly in Jesus. I take that from the end of Philippians 1, Philippians 1, 25 and 26. We are blessed by God to be a blessing. If you have the handout, I've put a brief summary there of what we're meant to be like as leaders. We're meant to be people who are captivated by the wonder of the gospel, friends. We're meant to be people who are full of the love of God and pouring it out. We're meant to be trophies of grace who are gracing other people, growing disciples who are glorying in Jesus. To use an illustration that I've used already this week and I wasn't going to do, but here we go. I'm a Baptist. I love illustrations that involve water. Uh, so imagine this is the Lord and this is you and the Lord fills you up and, you, you know, he's overflowing. So uh, I won't continue that illustration, but he's overflowing and overflowing and overflowing. He doesn't stop. And the question I have for you is how does the blessing get out from you to bless those around you? Well, too often what we do is we take a drill and we punch holes in the cup. <laughs> That late night meeting where you took decisions at midnight and then you fretted till three in the morning and it knocked you out for the next couple of days. Bang. And people are getting blessed by you. That person who rang you up 10 minutes after you got home from the church service and you were just settling down to dinner with your family and they say, I'm about to jump off a bridge unless you come and get me. And just as you're going out of the door, your daughter says, Daddy, why do you have to go and help that person and not spend time with me? and you're, you're blessing other people. That, uh, that ministry decision that you have to take and you can't defend for pastoral reasons and you know that the criticism's gonna come. That great sermon that you preached or that Bible study that you did, but the, the preparation time overflowed and you had to pull an all-nighter. 
You know, you, you all know the things. You know what it's like to bless other people out of your depletion, don't you? They're getting blessed. They don't know you're running on fumes. What's the other way? Well, of course, we patch up the holes in the cup, and the Lord is carrying on overflowing until we come out of overflow and not out of depletion. The fact of the matter is, nobody knows the difference except you and the Lord. But you really do. If you're giving out of depletion, I give you 15 years before you wear out. I don't think there are very many exceptions. I'll say a bit more about that in a minute. Many years ago, when I met a Christian leader who was struggling on the ragged edge and in danger of going over it, I started to make a list of the factors. You might want to make a note of a book title, uh, Fruitful Leaders, How to Make, Grow, Love, and Keep Them, which is a book that I wrote off the back of that list a few years ago. And uh, I list everything in the appendix, and everybody says, yeah, the book's a bit okay, but the appendix is great. So buy the book for the appendix. It got to be quite a long list quite quick. You can see it on the handout under section two. But uh, to summarize, people were identifying, here are the main categories, pressures on family and friendships. And particularly, you know, we, we work all weekends when our families are available and we don't work when our families are not available. Feeling devalued, feeling unable to lead, feeling the job is too big and feeling spiritually isolated. Now, you will notice on that list what isn't there is self-inflicted issues that kill leaders, leadership suicide, giving up on orthodoxy, um, issues that make you drift from the gospel, although some of these things might lead you into that too. Now, usually, we can survive one or two draining factors. But what also happens over 15 years, as people bring you their issues and you absorb them and you become the toxic waste barrel for their, you know, you know, those toxic waste barrels, they've got a big radioactive sign on the side, and you start to fill up, don't you? And who do you dump that on? Well, you may be lucky enough to have a counselor. If, if, if you're in social services or counseling, you will have that. You can't get into that without one. But most people in pastoral ministry don't. Where they dump it is their spouse, and their toxic barrel fills up as well. Toxic barrel's basically a fool when you get to 15 years, and it's kind of slopping over the top. Get another three broken marriages in your church at any one time and a bereavement in your family, nobody survives. Nobody survives. You can survive one draining factor. Maybe you can survive two or three. It's when they come together, and we all find at that point we are living in exhaustion and fear or blowing up. Who's seen the movie uh, Deepwater Horizon? I saw it recently on, uh, on Amazon Prime. It's a great movie about uh, uh, the world's worst oil rig disaster. If you're into movies with big explosions in them, that's the movie for you, Deep, Deep Water Horizon. But what happens is that by the time we have seen a tiny little spark, all of a sudden ignite this enormous conflagration. You say, well, how? Wasn't that a disproportionate result from a tiny spark? But the fact is, it's not just from a tiny spark, because we've seen this enormous set of lurking issues that go behind it. The gas leaks, lack of maintenance, lack of care and attention given to equipment, neglect, greed. We see the backstory. It's very, very easy. When you see Christian leaders collapse, and it's always catastrophic, because we usually leave it far too long to deal with things. We leave it until we're so far over the edge, and then just one more issue comes along, and we go catastrophically over a cliff rather than manage it. And nobody asks, what was the backstory to that? What were the last five years like? What were the last 15 years like? When that happens to us, if we don't have the necessary support, encouragement, people who lift up our arms, we are very likely to find ourselves burnt out. I think after 15 years, there are very few exceptions. As I was listening to folks sitting at my kitchen table 15 years ago, uh, we set up a thing called the Pastoral Refreshment Conference and it opened the floodgates on our pastoral team. And, and I ended up just sitting with Christian worker after Christian worker after Christian worker for about 50% of my life for years. Other things that I heard time and time again were these. 
just to press into a little more detail on this. So firstly, what I like to call ICED, I-C-E-D, the walls of the cell that lock you in, isolation, complexity, exhaustion, and discouragement. Isolation is the big one that finally forces people out. But you know, I know very few jobs that I think are both as isolated and as complex as pastoral ministry. I know plenty of jobs that are complex. Brain surgery is complex, but you're not isolated and you've got team and you've got procedures and you've got safety nets and you've got insurance and all the rest of it. Plenty of jobs are, are isolated, but not complex. Fishermen. But I know very few that are isolated and complex like pastoral ministry. People not giving attention uh, to, oh, load exceeding limit over a long time. Yeah, okay, load exceeding limit over a long time. When your load is greater than your limit, that excess is spiritual depletion. You can't survive it for very long. Not least of all, because um, it is space with the Lord out of which emerges prayerfulness, worship, wisdom, Sabbath, being human. Nobody drops out of ministry because they forget how to lead a Bible study, because that's just competency. People drop out of ministry because we've forgotten to be human. <laughs> And when your, uh, lim uh, when, your load is greater, when your limit is greater than your load, that excess is spiritual healthiness. So people who have let their limits get pushed for a long time and therefore have normalized patterns that were unsustainable. That happens when you establish patterns at one point in your life and then your life circumstances change and you don't change the patterns. For example, if you set up patterns in ministry when you are single and 28, don't expect it to be the same when you're married with four kids and 40. But loads of people do expect it to be the same. In fact, they expect you to be more capable and more competent and to be able to shoulder bigger burdens. You may have young children and elderly parents at a distance by this point, but no permission to renegotiate. A 41-year-old vicar of four churches in the UK came to see me a little while ago. He said, can I show you my list of responsibilities? I said, of course. He got out this wadge of fan-fold computer paper. You know the stuff? It went on and on and on. And I said, well, how did you get into that? He said, well, it just built up over time. I have no permission to renegotiate. What do you think is going to happen to me? I said, I think one of three things is going to happen to you. Either you will carry on trying to do that list for the next three years, and then I assure you, you are on the casualty list. I guarantee it. You will be gone. Or you can stop and run now and look for another ministry position while you still have some life left in your body, or you can go to the parish councils of the four churches and say, here's what I'm doing, it's too much for me, can we renegotiate it? And he said, I can't do that one, I simply have no permission to do it. That's really interesting, I said, well, you tell me what the other option is. He said, I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll try to be courageous enough to do it. And he came back to me several months later and he said, I did it. And they said, we never knew we just didn't know what you were doing. And that's very normal. There was a very interesting piece of work in Australia a good number of years ago now where uh, uh, the Bishop of Adelaide, a guy called Peter Brain, found that a lot of his clergy were burning out or struggling over sin over which they had no power. And he did a very simple piece of work, and that was he asked uh, his clergy how many uh, days a week they were working and how many hours a week they were working and found there was a 15-hour discrepancy over what the church wardens thought they were working. Nobody in our congregations knows how long it takes to, to do stuff. A diaconate in a Baptist church came to me a little while ago and said, we need to do an annual review of our minister. We have no idea how much he is working. Can you help us add it up? So I said, this is how long he's taking to prepare a sermon. This is how long he's spending in pastoral visitation. Here's how long he's spending supervising staff, etc., etc., etc." They looked at me with absolute horror and said, are you telling us he's doing a 70-hour week? And I said, yes, what did you think? <coughs> They said, we thought he was doing 45. Well, expect that guy to be burnt out. So, not giving attention to our limits over an extended period of time. And that then takes us into the third thing. It squeezes out your life with God. When you can't say no, task replaces Jesus, doesn't it? So your inner life is no longer adequate to your outer life in leadership. A gulf emerges between the two. Nobody knows because you put on a great big mask, don't you, and you constantly smile at people in church, even when you're dying inside. That breaks sooner or later. We are brittle creatures. 
I found repeated time and time again unhealthy life and ministry patterns and habits, spiritual, physical, emotional, relational. I wonder, do your patterns and habits, does your Sabbath work for healthiness or does it work for unhealthiness? Does your diary work for your healthiness or for your unhealthiness? We all have patterns and habits, deliberate or not. In some senses, we are the sum of our habits. The question is, are they working for your spiritual healthiness or against it? Inadequate support structures, inadequate scaffolding for the demands of this perilous leadership role that we have. In my 30s, I was handling some pretty heavy decisions, and I had good people around me. In my 40s, they got heavier, and those people were going to glory. In my 50s, everybody thinks that I'm entirely adequate and self-sustaining now. And they think, well, who would dare ask? Who would dare ask the minister of the church who feeds them? Well, who's feeding you? Nobody asks. If you ever get to guest preach in a, another church, say to the congregation, do you know who, who feeds the people who feed you? Nobody knows. They just assume that it happens. They hope that it happens. But it leads to this weird thing after 15 years. In many, many churches, the people who feed everybody else are the least fed people themselves. And then it shouldn't surprise you if they go over a cliff. And they do go over a cliff in very large numbers, aged 15 years or around 45, whichever comes first. Because what they've done is they've set up unsustainable patterns when they were 30. And they now have an inability or a perceived inability to renegotiate those conditions. These things are extremely common in Christian work. They lead to a lot of burnout, and that was before the pandemic. But of course, now we have that as well. COVID produces a lot of stresses of its own, doesn't it? But I think that it also reveals that for many, we were living at the limit or beyond the limit before the pandemic. If you are already discouraged, isolated with your spiritual life stalled and your church life stalled, or put those two together, that's a bad combination, isn't it? Spiritual life stalled and church life stalled at the same time. And your ministry situation being resistant to you changing anything. Or you think, even if I try, maybe I could change it if I had more energy, but the pushback's going to be so much that I'm going to cut against the grain then you just think, well, you know, the path of least resistance is just to carry on and just getting more and more depleted. Uh, to put it another way, um, I was listening to a radio broadcast recently about um, logistics and supply chains. In the UK, those are big issues for us at the moment, post-Brexit, logistics and supply chains. And the logistics expert used the following initials to describe his world. V-U-C-A, volatility, uncertainty, complexity, ambiguity. And that's quite good too. Volatility, uncertainty, complexity, ambiguity. It's quite close to my ICED, I-C-E-D, isn't it? In fact, volatility, uncertainty, and ambiguity produce isolation, complexity, exhaustion, and discouragement. Because it is impossible in ministry to get rid of uncertainty and complexity. They are a given. This is a complex and ever-changing work with complex and ever-changing people. The thing that will determine whether we cope with it in the long term is whether our spiritual habits and patterns help us deal with volatility and ambiguity. More about that later. So I experienced, uh, I experienced burnout myself in my early 40s. I had taught for some years that I expected 45 to be a crunch point for everybody. And in my pride, I thought I was the exception. And then we had a huge tragedy in our family. It wasn't a ministry thing. My heart was fine. There was nothing wrong with the ministry. It's just we had uh, two stillborn children. And you know that something like that is going to happen in your life sooner or later. You're going to be bereaved. You are going to be wounded. You are going to be scarred. We live in this veil of tears. It is going to happen. And I found myself plummeting into a black hole of fear, depression, and a deep desire to flee ministry. And as I came through it over several years with the help of a good counselor, I started to come across more and more of us who had experienced something similar. 
and experience what I was experiencing in terms of ministry anxiety, fear, and catastrophizing. Catastrophizing was the last element for me. I didn't go a little way over the edge of the cliff. I went the whole way over the cliff. Absolutely headlong plummeting into the depths. What that revealed to me as I was thinking about it later on was actually there was a lot going under, on underneath in my life. Just stuff that I couldn't really see or process. We don't on our own, you know. And that led me eventually into a lot of conversations about what leads us in Christian work into fear. What is the shape of ministry-related fear? What are the roots into it for Christian workers? It can seem very, very scary, very hard to get a handle on. Any of you who have ever suffered a panic attack or an anxiety issue, I know what that's like. Lurking fear is the thing that all these other factors produce. And ministry has some unique ways to produce it. And the devil loves it. Satan will like to silence you taking the gospel to the ends of the earth in the power of the Holy Spirit. And I think that fear is one of his chief tactics. Sin is obviously the other big one because fear paralyzes us. By fear, I mean that that feeling, that apprehension that I am going to be overwhelmed and harmed. It's a multi-layered thing. We're not going to tease it apart completely in such a short session. But it's often rooted in thinking that the things that I hope are going to keep me safe aren't going to keep me safe. They're just not going to bear my weight. When I really need it, they're going to give way under me. It's a, a prevailing state of mind that is the opposite of feeling safe. It's the opposite of peace and trust. It's the embracing of an unhealthy emotional life. It is the opposite of thankfulness. The great antidote to fear actually is thankfulness. If thankfulness is about trust and faith, delighting in God's love and holiness, then fear is designed to take you out of that space. Perfect love drives out fear. Satan would love to use fear to drive out the love of God from your life. So I'm going to describe to you now what I believe are three common stages on the route into ministry-related fear and then burnout. And then we'll take some time to discuss them. So, number one. Stage one, imposter syndrome. You ever standing at the front of a group teaching and expect somebody to walk in at the back and shout, stop that woman, she's an imposter, she doesn't know what she's talking about. Stop that man, he hasn't got any credentials. I think the first step into ministry-related fear for quite a lot of people seems to be some version of imposter syndrome. That sooner or later, I will be unmasked as a fake or a fraud. <coughs> Particularly if we know that we're standing up giving a message and our hearts really aren't in that right space with the Lord. Because you and I can do that out of pure technical competency and nobody knows the difference. We are all regularly involved in some things that we know how to do and quite a lot of things that we don't know how to do. But people want us to know how to do them, so we kind of tell little lies, don't we? Yeah, of course, of course I can do that. Of course I can do that. Remember my very first uh, day in ministry as a young intern in UCCF. Uh, it's called the Relay Program. The Relay Program, the interns in UCCF had never existed before. We were the first. And the one thing we were absolutely sure of was everybody was going to know that we were competent. We're the young Christian workers. We were all crying inside. And after three days, somebody burst into tears, and then we all burst into tears. It was so helpful. <laughs> but we are tempted to, uh, to make people think that we can do things we can't do because we want them to think well of us. We're tempted towards responding to needs and demands we don't know how to deal with by adopting this serene persona that's so at odds with what's going on behind the mask. Psychologically, I am told that it is weakness and powerlessness that produce imposter syndrome. And of course, weakness and powerlessness is precisely where we're meant to live our ministries. 
2 Corinthians 12, isn't it? When we are weak, then that is when the sufficiency of God's grace is seen and known. And people try to get out of weakness by being control freaks or by waiving our qualifications. Look, I must be adequate to this job. I've got a piece of paper with an MDiv on it. But the thing that God empowers uh, in ministry is weakness, and that can also produce imposter syndrome. So I think imposter syndrome is a very interesting first step. I've already described to you the cell, I-C-E-D. I think this is what traps us. Commonly, a trigger-presenting issue that causes fear then makes a longer-standing lurking set of factors emerge. Now, when you are riding the crest of a wave in ministry, there are all kinds of things, aren't there, in ministry that actually you never get closure on because we're dealing with pastoral issues in people's lives. And that's, that's not like a project that you can stop. So we end up with loads of open inputs, outputs, and sort of open, open loops in our lives. And when we're doing too much in ministry, but we're riding the crest of a wave, it's all going really well, um, you have the energy to push those to the back burner of your life. Yeah? You don't actually deal with them. You don't close them off. You don't stop them. They're on the back burner there. When you then hit the bottom of the trough, you have no energy. It's not that you just hit the bottom of the trough. You haven't got energy to keep those things on the back burner either. So they all pile off. And you get this huge amplitude magnification going on at exactly the point that you have least energy. That's why catastrophizing is relatively common. When a straw breaks the camel's back, a whole set of longer-term unresolved issues and buried things are emerging as well. And the things that I think form the cell that closes in around us are this combination of isolation, complexity, exhaustion, and discouragement. Let three or four different kinds of complex issues coincide. I guess some of the most common in our churches are marriage breakdowns. But let three or four coincide. Let three or four tragedies hit at once. Nobody copes. We're not meant to. We're not built for that. But we know that we are vessels for everybody else's hopes, comforts, fears, tragedies, criticisms, their ambitions for their own spiritual life and for the church. But we tread into this perilous country with very few safety nets very often. And the more senior and experienced and competent we get, the less others think that we need that kind of scaffolding and mentoring around us. Despite the fact that our burdens are getting heavier and heavier, the situations are getting more complex and toxic, and our inputs are getting less and less and more sporadic. Oh, the danger is that we become the toxic bucket for more and more difficult issues over time. And our overall level of internal toxicity always rises because there are no outlets. If you're in a caring profession like counseling or social work, you can't really do it where I am without, uh, without a professional pastoral supervisor. And a big part of their job is to detoxify the worker without toxifying you. Many of you carry burdens that are at least as complex, nuanced, and heavy as anybody in those spheres, but without the person who detoxifies us. We're often prevented as well from dealing with these issues. We get locked in by some combination of guilt, sadness, church culture that means that we cannot renegotiate, and negative repetitive conditioning that leads us instead to strategies for avoidance and denial or self-medicating. You can self-medicate by, uh, by doing bad things, by sinning, looking for some kind of release or control, or by doing good things, but doing them too much. Lots of us self-medicate by overeating. Sometimes I self-medicate by watching too many episodes of The West Wing back to back. Yeah. One episode's good, 10 episodes <coughs> less so. You can self-medicate by doing bad things, and you can self-medicate by doing good things. The longer we don't deal with things, the longer we live in denial and avoidance, the harder it becomes to do it. There are multiple locks that disincentivize dealing with debilitation. And then we get to stage three. We get sucked into what I call the vortex. The vortex of entropy. 
in which we spiral round and round and down and down into subjectivity and irrationality. Firstly, feeling unsupported and then insecure, getting into subjectivity, so I'm only listening now to the internal voices in my head. I'm looking at things through, through really bad lenses, you know. I'm thinking, uh, I feel bad, so it is bad. Um, uh, yeah, ba bad lenses, false evaluative lenses that magnify the bad and minimize the good. And that leads you into paranoia very, very easily. Uh, then, what do you, what, what do you do to, to avoid thinking about it too much? More ministry. The very thing that's leading you there is the thing that you use to try to, to avoid it. So you fill up all your time trying to deliver what you think people expect because you're also getting applauded for that. So you're getting applauded for living in socially approved self-harm and you get criticized if you try to get out of it. You're becoming increasingly aware of all the things that people want you to deliver, but you can't. You don't know how to break the cycle. You're thinking other people should turn up and help me. And the fact that they're not means clearly they're not concerned about me or my ministry. In fact, it's usually because you just haven't told them. Very often, our spouses also feel obliged to collude in our feelings when we get to that point, lest they are perceived to be part of the problem. Of course they're going to want to help and encourage us, but they might be helping and encourage us into irrationality. And then we get to stage four, which is avoidance, evasion, and escape. In Looked After Children's Work and, uh, and uh, Thinking About Adoption, um, you hear a lot about this image of the gun to the back of the head. Imagine a child thinking that they have an invisible gun to the back of the head, and the slightest thing that they do wrong might cause it to go off so they die at any point, but they never know when. So they live in paralysis and fear and constantly wanting to please. Children who have been abused might look like they are really well behaved, when in fact what they're living with is post-traumatic stress disorder and this feeling that if I do not behave, something dreadful is going to happen. Unprocessed emotions don't die. Instead, we live with a subconscious script of this gun being pointed at us, which might go off unpredictably. We are not safe. I'm living on the edge. The last thing I can cope with is one more piece of criticism in church. So I will do absolutely everything to avoid it. But the gun's only visible to us. So you'd start trying to con of either avoid the things that might make the gun go off, situations, controversial subjects, people, relationships, and instead what you do is you start to build structures for personal security. Whether that's uh, with people that we trust to not unsettle us, whether it's by building a carefully curated public persona, whether it is control freakery, the obvious image is uh, the wearing of masks, isn't it? And this whole descent makes us being very careful of exposure. Nobody must know what I'm like. By this point, the chances of you being a chief repenter in the church so that everybody else knows how to do it has gone years before. No chance of that. You want to appear sorted, which is why we carry on saying yes to things beyond our capacity because we don't want people to think that we're inadequate. But by then, we've got two faces. And then that just adds to the internal accusation that the devil loves to bring. You're a hypocrite. Step five, the cliff. When we get stuck in this, we put more and more effort into delivering what we think is required. It leads to greater and greater vulnerability to very small triggers, the tiny little spark that sets off the massive explosion. And we frequently work under highly emotional expectations push those things to the back burner, as I've said, when we've got energy, and they all come off when we haven't. So all the stuff that we suppress comes to the fore at precisely the moment that you're wrestling with everybody, with everything else. This is a feedback loop. If we get into it and we leave patterns unremedied, then fear and burnout are practically guaranteed sooner or later. All of a sudden, you find that ministry has stopped you being human. You have to smile at everybody. 
you have to never complain about anything. Everybody else in the church can. Oh, by the way, everybody else in the church thinks that they're not really complaining and nobody else does, so it's all right occasionally. Do the maths. A church of 200 in my neck of the woods is a big church. If everybody in it complains about something twice a year and thinks they're the only one, then they think it's an uncomplaining church, except that the pastor and elders are getting about 15 a week. And they really think it's a complaining church. So you have to smile. You never complain. You, you, you're the one who's allowed to be criticized, and you can't slap them. You've got to be always positive. And of course, you never need any sleep, do you? And you go off the cliff. I think there are plenty of specifics that generate fear for Christian leaders. Fear of man, fear of the world, the flesh, and the devil, fear of impossible expectations, fear of being accountable for everything, fear that I'm not fitted to this, introverts doing an extrovert's job, fear that relates to uh, bad work pay and conditions. Um, that gets worse after you're 40 for many of us. Come 40, I had a very, very low income. And some of my university friends were running the world <laughs> by this point. And uh, it's very easy to start to feel that by uh, heading into vocational ministry, other people are expecting you to make sacrifices that they wouldn't be prepared to make for their families. Fears for our kids is another one, isn't it? Fear relating to who am I inside and is it adequate to this ministry job? Fear that my family will suffer secondary trauma as a result of my ministry. All kinds of fears. What are the ways out? Well, these things are designed to destroy our joy in God. They are absolutely designed to get you out of the fear of the Lord by getting you to fear other things instead. There are a variety of ways of responding. You can respond inactively. Just denial, hope it goes away. Stick your head under the duvet. Hibernate. You can respond inactively. You wait for, uh, wait for issues to come up and then you just try to dodge them. We can adopt unhealthy strategies for self-soothing, like we've said, like traumatized kids who bang their heads hoping that that makes the pain go away, over investing in those good things like overwork, binge eating, out of a desire for control, acceptance, or to overcome something, or investing in the bad things as escape. Of course, it's far easier doing what we do to overinvest in the good things because the thing itself is not inherently sinful and might even get social approval, like overwork. That gets a lot of social approval. So the question is how we handle positively and actively rather than reactively, inactively, and negatively. What interrupts that cycle of fear and the negative response conditioning that goes with it? I think it is, well, in the words of Isaiah 61, I think it is God saying, I will give them the garment of praise instead of the spirit of heaviness. I will grant to those who mourn. I will grant. You don't, you don't grab it. You don't get it yourself. It is given. It is given through approaching, appreciating, and enjoying the Lord. And these things are absolutely designed to help us stop enjoying the Lord. It's a battle for joy that's going on here. Now, feed in other things like medical conditions and depression. Isn't depression a dreadful word? Just so flat for something that is so appalling. What should we call it instead? That murderous blackness or something or other, but it's such a dreadful word. But anyway, what we're after is appropriating the joy of the Lord. We, we want him granting to those of us who are mourning a garment of praise instead of the spirit of heaviness. What interrupts these cycles? They're, they're, they're multi-layered, aren't they? So I am very cautious about suggesting quick fixes to deep-rooted issues, because it's rarely like that. It's rarely about just making a little change. 
working these things through doesn't really have a systematic order and movement often because when you deal with things in one area, it has consequences in other areas. But at the risk of being far too simple, here are a few things that I don't think guarantee that we get out of fear and out of burnout, but I think I can guarantee that if you haven't got them, you're less likely to. <laughs> okay? So number one, intervention. We never get out of it on our own. And one of the devil's great tactics is to say you don't own up. So stay in the cell on your own. Stay in the vortex on your own. Getting out is almost always accompanied by perspective and intervention from outside. People who want to bring us to a place of safety. Because unless you get first to a place of safety, then you can't get to a place of understanding. And if you can't get to a place of understanding, it's very rare to get to a place of healing. Actually, when you get people bringing you to a place of safety and sense, then you can begin to work on longer term and more complex matters. But you can't do it when you're just trying to work through uh, in the middle of your own turmoil. What intervention helps with? Well, the critical thing is objectivity. Breaking those negative feedback loops with positive ones. People who let in the light. Bringing sense to circumstances. Bringing sense to feelings. Helping us frame things in constructive ways. Very often, somebody who comes and brings intervention can't change your circumstances and they can't change your trauma. But what they can do is help you frame it more constructively so that it is boundaried, that you are integrating it more helpfully into your life. And so the negative bits actually aren't overflowing into everything now. They provide scaffolding when we're falling over. And they help us to recover thanksgiving and worship. Remember, at the end of the day, this is about people who are bringing, to, bringing us into that place where we're getting a garment of praise in place of the spirit of heaviness. It is key to embracing healthy spiritual and emotional life. Recovery of worship, recovery of prayer, worship with thanksgiving. Ephesians 6 is the basic answer, isn't it? People help us put on the whole armor of God so we can stand against the devil's schemes of which fear and burnout are too. The question is, how do you do it? Practically, who helps you do it? How do you spiritually and practically take care to avoid the devil's fiery darts of fear? So, intervention from outside. Perspective, prayer, counsel, support. People who are helping you trust and seek the Lord in very practical ways and are helping you clear out of your life anything that is stopping it, anything that does the opposite. Not giving the devil a foothold. Getting rid of the demonic. Our, our, our enemy is not flesh and blood. We're fighting against spiritual, spiritual forces in the heavenly places. So I do think that there is huge value in supervisors, mentors, structures of input and support, people who help us worship. Gordon MacDonald used to talk about very resourceful people in our lives who counter very draining people in our lives. I don't know. Do you, you need a WhatsApp prayer group? Do you need some kind of good friendship network who you automatically pick up the phone to when fear is striking? What, what's your standard operating procedure? Who do you immediately ring early on in the cycle? And by the way, don't wait for anxiety to strike before you get to those things. So intervention, step one, bringing us to a place of safety and sense. Repair and recovery. Those are, those are step two. Without those people, we're very likely to get to repair and recovery. But when you start to gain some equilibrium and objectivity, then, then you're likely to be able to consider what are the relational factors that got me there? And what are relational factors are gonna get me out? Spiritually encouraging friends, counsel, support. What are the spiritual factors that got me there? And what are gonna get me out? Rest, prayer, worship. What are the emotional factors that got me there that were debilitating me and what are going to help me refocus and re-energize? Are there any physical factors that got me there? Lack of sleep. That's a biggie. There's a reason that repressive regimes use sleep deprivation, isn't there? Habitual routines that promote debilitation rather than habitual routines that promote freedom 
Are there any cognitive factors that got you there? What do you need to recalibrate, to understand, to construct positive things in your mental space that dismantle warped and unhealthy strategies? What are the practical and situational factors that will help you revise and reform the conditions? Are there historical situations that you are dealing with that have provoked fear? Long-term things in the organization or church's life that keep recurring, that never got dealt with, those principalities and you know, strongholds that you see sometimes. You, maybe you need to renegotiate impossible demands and repair situations of breakdown where you or others before you have done damage. Other habitual factors that are stopping you developing a robust spiritual life. Careful use of your diaries is a big one. And uh, for me, a huge one is never, ever saying yes on the spur of the moment. I never do that. I always say at the bare minimum, I'm terribly sorry, I can't answer that now. Um, give me 48 hours and I'll talk to my wife and get back to you. Because I know that I will get into a debilitative place if I don't. And lastly, repentance. Because there's always sin lurking in all of this, isn't there? For me, the critical thing is it is impossible to get the answers on your own. You are in the cell. You are in the vortex of entropy, and you're trapped in there with your own human sinfulness. Wholeness is not something that we get for ourselves. Getting out of the cell is almost always accompanied by perspective and intervention from outside. And then step three. Did I put step three on here? Nope. I did not put step three on here. Step three is the future. But you never go from step one to step, th you, never, you never go from the debilitative place to the future without going through intervention, repair, and recovery. If you're in the vortex and you think, I'll just change a few little things in life and that'll get me out of it, and that leads to the future and I'll, everything's fine all over again, it, it just isn't. There is no direct route to the future directly from being in the vortex. A process has got you in there, even if you can't see what it was, just stepping out unaided and suddenly being unburnt out, fear-free and sorted is unrealistic. I was going, if we had time, to ask us to think about uh, our support structures and standard operating procedures. I had a period in my ministry where I had what my colleagues called my autumn wobble. My autumn wobble, and it always struck towards the end of October and the start of November as I started to wake at two in the morning in a complete cold sweat thinking that my ministry was going to fall apart. And by the grace of God, it hasn't. It didn't stop me fearing it. And to start with, I was terrified. I did not know what I was experiencing. It was really awful. Sometimes I even wanted to hasten the failure of something in order that I could just get out. We do that, don't we? Now I know what I'm seeing. And I have instinctive reactions now that stop the cycle before I spiral too far down into fear. I have the list of phone numbers right beside my computer written up that I am going to ring at 8 o'clock the following morning of people who know, and they know what to do, and they know how to help me. I wonder what for you would constitute healthy, instinctive reactions when you wake up in that kind of space. There is one positive thing about fear on the way into burnout, and that is that it's an early warning system. <laughs> it's an alarm bell. It can highlight things that are going wrong under the surface, even if you don't know what they are. It's designed to catalyze you into taking steps before you get any further. Well, our time has gone. I hope that's uh, helped you think a little bit about some pathways that we can take into ministry-related fear and into burnout, or perhaps how to avoid it, or to start to think about what repair, recovery, structures, regulation, and people might help you move out of it if that's where you are at the moment. Perfect love casts out fear, and Satan would love to rob us of that and to use fear to sabotage and to steal the joy in God, which is the strength for our lives and the strength for our ministries.